Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, and I'd like to talk to you about personalized healthcare 2.0 under the exciting, albeit a bit provocative, title, Show Me Your Cancer, and I'll Give You Your Treatment. Um, clearly, 2.0 seems very low, as we are in the age of Industry 4.0, Revolutions 5.0, Web 6.0, but we are quite conservative in the pharma industry, so we'll stick with 2.0 uh, for the time being. So in order to talk about personalized treatment in cancer, I'd like to start a bit with what is, what is cancer exactly. And uh, most of you will have some experience with cancer to your friends or family suffering from that devastating disease. And we do know that cancer is probably the most common uh, cause of death in the, in the developed world. Uh, however, our knowledge usually uh, is limited to the fact that there are different types of cancer depending on the organ where the, where the tumor is located. So there is breast, lung, prostate cancer, and that it is treated with chemotherapy. So I'd like to tell you a bit how our thinking of cancer has evolved, but in order to understand that first, we need to understand what are the causes of cancer. And there are four primary factors which we consider as, as the, 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 the increased risk of cancer, and that is our lifestyle, the environment we live in, certain carcinogenic factors like uh, tobacco smoke, and finally genomic profiles. So some of us actually are more susceptible or at, at a higher risk of uh, developing cancer. But what all of these things have in common is that they drive in our body certain genomic uh, alterations or mutations, if you will. And these genomic alterations cause our cells to multiply faster than usual or not to die when those cells should be dying, and that leads to the growth of the tumor. Uh, so how has our thinking developed in the past? About 20 years ago, uh, we discovered, I say we, I haven't discovered, some of the scientists discovered that Certain breast cancer patients actually progress much faster with the disease and die faster, unfortunately. They looked at that and they identified that there's a certain driving mutation within the cancer that causes the breast cancer to progress faster. It's carried by about 20%. And they identified the way to diagnose that and also identified a treatment for that specific subgroup of patients. Um, the nice thing about it, it was there was actually a, a scientist with Polish origin, Mark Szlifkowski, who, is, who was involved in that discovery. And that led basically to the advent of personalized healthcare 1.0 because in that, uh, through that discovery, we were treating a patient group of about 20% of all the breast cancer patients with a targeted treatment, which was specifically targeted at the mutation which was uh, driving um, that type of cancer. So how have we evolved since, uh, f since those uh, 20 years? Uh, if we look at the example of lung cancer, 20 years ago when we look at lung cancer, we just thought it's one cancer, lung cancer. What we now know is that there are several mutations behind that lung cancer which are driving the development uh, of the lung cancer. Some of them are more common, about 20% of the lung cancer patients actually carry that mutation. Some of them are very rare, up to even 1% of those patients will only have cancer which has that mutation. And what's more, on top of that, we have another layer of differentiating factors. So uh, the, the mutations that I was referring to, you can see on the outer part of the circle. In the middle you see something called PDL1, and without getting into the details of that, that's like another layer of how we can actually identify and stratify those patients into even smaller groups of patients. And there are even more of these, not only PDL1, there is microsatellite instability, there is tumor mutational burden. I will not get into the technical details, but the premise of this is we are now dividing patients into smaller and smaller groups, and we're trying to find treatments for those smaller and smaller groups, which will be more personalized and which will offer better outcomes for the patients. They will essentially allow the patients to live longer and at a better quality of life. That sounds very good, doesn't it? So where is the catch? Well, the catch is basically in how do we diagnose those patients in order to uh, identify them for the treatment. And the traditional way of looking at this diagnosis has been, to put it in a very simplistic form, you take a biopsy of the cancer, you, you take a sample of the cancer tissue, you pre-treat it with certain chemicals, and then a pathologist looks at that sample and checks whether the mutation is there or not. The biggest hurdle connected with that approach 
was uh, that you had to know what you're looking for. So essentially, you were looking for a single mutation in that cancer tissue. So if you wanted to test for 20 mutations, you had to perform 20 tests one after another, which took time. It used up the, the tissue that, uh, that we were testing. And basically, there is a patient's life at stake, which we need to worry about. So the evolution to, to 2.0 in terms of personalized healthcare, the first part of it is really about engaging next generation sequencing into this testing. And with next generation sequencing, we can do all of those tests, so look for all the different mutations in different genes at the same time using the same cancer tissue. Uh, and uh, if you're wondering now what, what is next generation sequencing, this is basically the genes, genome sequencing that you've heard about when, you, when we talked about the human genome project in the past. It's just taken to a new level. So it's an evolution of the Sanger method that used to be uh, employed in such sequencing in the past. It's just more efficient and it's faster and it's cheaper. So if it's so beautiful that we can basically identify anything through NGS or next generation sequencing, is there any catch? Well, there are different methods employed in next generation sequencing. And uh, there is the so-called hotspot method, and there is the um, compre comprehensive genomic profiling. And what the hotspot method looks, uh, looks at is really looking at parts of the gene where the mutations are most commonly found, and it only looks for a specific subset of these, uh, of these mutations. And to maybe give you a, a more simplistic metaphor, if you, if you will, the hotspot search, if you're looking for a puncture on a tire, the hotspot search will only look on the part of the tire which is touching the road, and it will only look for nails, because that's what we usually find on the road. Whereas what the comprehensive genomic profiling does, it looks at everything and tries to find any mutation. So the comprehensive genomic profiling looks also at the side of the, uh, of the rubber, and it also looks for screws and anything else. So with this, we get a much more comprehensive uh, picture. So does that come at a cost? Yes, it does, because obviously the comprehensive genomic profiling gives you a, a lot of data. It gives you big data, which you need to be able to understand. And this is where bioinformatics comes in, because with the help of very advanced algorithms, we're able to analyze that big data and provide meaningful information. And this is where biology and informatics uh, comes together. And I do believe that this is where the future of science is at the integration of these different, um, uh, these different sciences. So informatics, biology, uh, physics, and so on. Uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, you see a, a report. So the outcome of those algorithms. This is a, a report from a test called Foundation One from Foundation Medicine. And it basically shows you different mutations that the cancer of this patient carries. And it also shows you that for some of these mutations, we already have uh, medicines, treatments, which are already approved and ready to use. For some others, we have medicines which are in testing in clinical trials. So we can help patients find those clinical trials and get treated there. Hopefully, uh, they will prove that the medicine works. And then there are some mutations where we don't actually have an answer yet. So we don't have a medicine to treat patients carrying those mutations. So what do we do about those? Well, this is where the second part of PHC 2.0 comes in, and this is about using real-life data from the hospital settings, from, from the settings where we treat patients, where we diagnose patients, to power the science, to basically provide information to the science on the patients. We look at the patients, obviously in an anonymized way, to see how the patients respond to different treatment, what different mutations the patients carry, and how does that impact their outcomes um, uh, in terms of uh, their disease. And again, here we're talking about big data, because if you imagine that there are millions of people with cancer uh, being diagnosed uh, every year, we are talking about huge numbers, and the possibility to analyze this data, again, lies with bioinformatics, where we need the, the input from biologists to understand what we're looking at, and then we need the informatics professionals to be able to process that information and draw meaningful conclusions. So what could be next? Where is PHC 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, and so forth? I strongly believe that this lies in the so-called oncology vaccines. Now, most of us, when we hear vaccines, we think this is a medicine which is supposed to be administered to a healthy 
person to prime their immune system to start fighting against a disease that will come at a later stage. This is slightly different. The, the premise of the oncology vaccines is different because here we are talking about a person who already has cancer. But the idea is to take a biopsy from this person who already has, has cancer, then analyze that cancer for all the different possible mutations and driving factors which would trigger what kind of treatment we give them and then produce a vaccine which is really individualized. We're talking now about identifying the person's own personalized cancer profile and then producing a treatment for one specific person. Up to now, what we were doing is we were taking ready-made treatments and giving them to patients or looking for combinations of treatments to give to patients depending on what, what, what was the, the profile of the cancer. Here we're really talking about producing a personalized medicine and the ambition is to do to be able to do it from diagnosis to administration to the patient within eight to ten weeks because time is really what matters most in the oncology setting the really exciting thing for me about this is this would ha have not been possible i mean the idea has been around for a number of years the biggest problem was technology and this would not have been possible without the te technology which was actually developed in warsaw at the university of warsaw uh, a team of uh, biologists developed, <coughs> excuse me, uh, developed uh, the possibility to stabilize um, mRNA, and that will most probably form the backbone of this um, of this technology. Genentech, a, a, a division of Roche, uh, has actually purchased that technology last year for 300 million uh, US dollars, and they are now using that to develop this concept. And I hope that this is uh, what the future will look like, and we will be able to offer people personalized treatment uh, for cancer. So do I believe that PHC 2.0 already delivers on the promise to, to treat cancers? I believe we are in the midst of a revolution. I do believe we are delivering on a, on a promise to bring more personalized treatments. And we can see that through the best metric, and that is the length of the patient lives, and that is the length, of, uh, of, uh, the length and the quality of, uh, of patients' lives who are being treated with this more personalized treatment. But there is obviously still a lot to be left. And I'm very happy that we as Poland are involved in that, not only through the discoveries that I've already told you about, but also through the fact that in, in Roche Poland, we have more than 500 bioinformatics specialists who are now working exactly on, on, on technologies like this, which will hopefully bring the hope to, to cancer patients in the future. Thank you very much.